bond investing kind for 25 years and I've never seen a market like this in the sense that commodities making new all-time highs like gold made new record all-time highs in the last few weeks and uh, you would not guess that's the case by looking at the average junior mining resource portfolio or talking to the average gold mining investor which perversely guy is actually a very bullish thing because you know bull markets when they get too excited everybody's talking about it and taxi drivers are talking about it and the people in the subway are talking about it usually it's the end and, and conversely in 2020 when the gold had its last big run everybody was talking about it right you know youtube views were way up people were talking about it on the subways tax driver everybody owned gold stocks back then during the covid crisis today that's not the case Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and of course your host for this channel. And today we have a bit of a spe special episode prepared for you because uh, first of all, I got the YouTube title already ready and uh, prepared, which is usually not the case when I do the interviews because I base the titles on what we discuss. Uh, but today it's a, diff it's a different story because we're talking a lot of micro, we will discuss a lot of the micro uh, end of what we usually talk about meaning mining companies mining sentiment and of course uh, some of the metals precious metals commodities in general so we're, we're going to do that um first time guest on the program michael michael gentilly he's a strategic investor in the junior mining space somebody you might have heard of heard of before because he's been quite active and for quite a while in the market and somebody who's been maybe help or helping say or gee my, my english is broken today but he's been helping saving canadian mining does that make sense? Is that grammatically correct? Please correct me in the comments down below. Uh, I always, uh, always happy to learn. But uh, subscribe as well before I switch over. Now, Michael, it is great to see you. Sorry, I've been stuttering a little bit, so trying to make sense and thinking a lot of thoughts at the same time. But uh, it is great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here, Kai. Yeah, like uh, really, really looking forward to this because uh, we've been trying to connect for a while. It's the first time we're chatting as well. Um, let, let's start with a bit of a general question and. Uh, What's the mood like? What's sentiment in junior mining like these days? Yeah, I mean, the sentiment is pretty tough still. I mean, the, I think investors have been asking themselves for probably the greater part of four or five years as to why their junior mining stocks are not up a lot more than they should be. Uh, I've been doing commodity investing Kai for 25 years, and I've never seen a market like this in the sense that commodities making new all-time highs. Like gold made new record all-time highs in the last few weeks, and uh, you would not guess that's the case by looking at the average junior mining resource portfolio or talking to the average gold mining investor, which perversely guy is actually a very bullish thing because you know, bull markets, when they get too excited, everybody's talking about it and taxi drivers are talking about it. And the people in the subway are talking about it. Usually it's the end. And, and conversely in 2020, when the gold had its last big run, everybody was talking about it, right? You know, YouTube views were way up. People were talking about it in the subways, taxi driver, everybody owned gold stocks back then during the COVID crisis today. That's not the case. So actually that, to me, it's quite bullish that we're making record highs in the commodities, that the industry is more healthier, healthier than it's ever been financially. And you start looking at the financial statements of the major mining companies, the cash flow they're going to start to generate at these prices, yet no one's talking about it. So to me, you're right, it's been a bit of a stealth bull market or a painful bull market that has not really unleashed itself on the majority of the companies. Uh, I think you posted up a chart there really briefly, but yeah, the, the large caps, the Newmonts, the Barracks are starting to work. Agnico's are starting to go up. Ken Ross's are doing really well. What's caught my attention, Kai, in the last few months is that the mid-tier gold producers, the IM Golds, the Torexes, are up, you know, 50 to 100% themselves. And most importantly, you know, is the developers, you know, the Osisco mining getting taken out, right? Philo mining getting taken out. Uh, Skeena resources being up 50 to 100%. Those are stocks that are not yet producing gold, and those are rallying strongly, which we did not see in previous uh, mini bull markets or mini up cycles we saw in the last four or five years. So the, the market's broadening slowly, quietly, uh, painfully for most, but I think the next step will be a bigger generalist participation and a broader retail participation, and that'll light up the, the smaller stocks on the end of the spectrum. I think that many of your viewers and myself are, are heavily invested in. Yeah, I forgot to mention in my intro, I was going to, I'm titling this video, The Worst Bull Market Ever. And uh, I'm, I'm stealing that from a, a Twitter comment somebody posted below one of my tweets, but it, but it feels true. Like it is a bull market. I've, you've just seen the, the, the stock performance here year to date. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm gold is up 100%. Like Nico Eagle, 50%. Uh, they're outpacing the S&P 500, yet nobody's talking about it. And mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do we need a trigger to talk about it? I always thought that gold marking new all-time highs, breaking out above 2000 would be that trigger, but it doesn't seem like it. Do you have a suspicion, Michael, why that is the case? Like, and what could be that trigger? 
Yeah, for me, I've been talking a lot about Q2, Q3, and Q4 earnings. And if you look at the last run, we had a goal, say, from 2015, 16 to 2020, when gold went from like 15, 1600 to 2000, that's about $4 move in the gold price. And many investors got very excited at the time and were disappointed because what happened, Kai, was the gold price went up four to five hundred dollars an ounce, but the the costs of the producers, because we are in a hyperinflationary environment, the all-in sustaining costs, the average cost to produce for these producers went up about four hundred dollars an ounce. So you had a big move in the gold price. Investors bought these stocks, anticipating them making a lot of money, and what ended up happening is their margins actually were flat because the the, the cash increase in the gold price was completely offset by their increase in costs, and so that caused a lot of disappointment. If you go from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty four. The gold price kind of grinded between 1800 and 2000 and the gold the cost kept going higher so if you look at where we were kind of 23 kai like last year uh the margins per ounce for a lot of gold producers were actually lower than they were in 2016. and so the, a lot of big generalist investors said you guys are terrible you're never going to make any money gold price went up by four or five dollars an ounce and actually have a lower cash margin today than you had five years ago this industry is is a permanent loser and so if you remember in the bank of montreal mining conference 2023 I think Newmont hit a 52 week low back then. And I think what happened there, investors were just throwing their hands and going, you guys are pathetic. We're never going to make any money. We don't want to touch you. Well, fast forward today, gold price has gone from 1800 to about 2,500. So gold price up like $700 an ounce and anecdotally cost maybe up 50 bucks an ounce. So you're seeing like 500 to $700 per ounce of margin expansion. But as you know, the gold price is lagged, right? So Q2 was the first quarter where we saw true systematic margin expansion in the big guys, the Kinrosses, the Agnicos, right? The Newmonts were showing real margin expansion, real expanding free cash flows, balance sheets getting further strength, which they're already in pretty good shape today. I think Q3 is going to be even better because the gold price is going to be even higher than it was in Q2 and Q4, probably the same thing as you roll that higher gold price through the numbers. So, so the fundamentals that the generalists follow, kind of like the guy that can buy a tech stock or a real estate stock or an industrial stock or a restaurant, he's going to see, or he or she's going to see expanding margins companies beating consensus estimates raising numbers raising guidance raising cash flow estimates while importantly the other thing we have also seen kai we've been competing with a very strong bull market so tech has been a runaway freight train to the upside in terms of ai and all these magnificent seven tech stocks so investors will be able to make lots of money elsewhere so they go i got this industry it's not really expanding margins not really growing profitability i got the markets making me lots of money why do i need to own gold stocks so we've, we've spoken as to why gold stocks are going to be more and more profitable, rising estimates, rising profitability, really dramatic increases in, in uh, profitability and, and consensus estimates. But the nice second piece of puzzle we need to see Kai too is the rest of the market has to roll over. And I, I work in a Bastion Asset Management, a co-founder of a big investment management firm as well. And we're seeing slowing across the board in almost every single industry. So I think earnings estimates for the other industries are definitely either flattening or heading down, while the gold industry is going to see rising estimates. And that's what attracts investors out of healthcare, out of tech, out of retail, out of industrials, into gold. And that's the fund flows we need to see to have gold start to really catch the extension of the mainstream. And then these plus 50% moves could become plus 200% moves very, very fast. Because as you know, Kai, it's a very small market cap sector, right? The whole mining sector is like one third of Apple's market cap, you know? So if a little bit of money comes out of tech and rotates into gold and precious metal stocks, these stocks will have epic runs. And the, more importantly, the fundamentals are lining up on both sides. The overall market is slowing versus gold stocks are accelerating their earnings growth. And that is a really nice combination to see a big inflow of capital into the gold and precious metal space. 100%. And maybe to summarize it as well, Stanley Druckenmiller is one of the investors, one of the big investors or big name investors that has been starting to roll over some of his uh, or move over some of his fund, uh, his funds into our precious metal space. He's been buying Barrick. He's been buying Newmont. Like maybe to follow up uh, on what you just mentioned there. Are you seeing money flowing in now? Like, ha has that started? Like, you know, it's like I'm always looking for signs and yeah. maybe some somewhere where I can track it. Like, because it, it's not showing up in the financings, not for the on the junior yeah. end. That's way too early stage. But uh, yeah. do do you see volume increase in those stocks like the Newmonts, the Barracks, the Agnico Eagles? Yes, performance is up, but uh, we all know when volume is down, it's easy to man manipulate uh, a, a stock chart, right, and uh, push yeah. it higher. For example, do, do you see volume increase? Yeah, you're starting to see journalist money show up in small increments. You can you can tell that by the fact that the you know, the Alamoses of the world or the you know the, the safe kind of premier jurisdiction names, you know, I am Gold has a great asset in Canada, are starting to see big moves and in inflows. Typically, what happens is you'll, the journalist will go, "Okay, I own zero gold. I recognize some of the things that I said earlier about the overall market prospects slowing, the overall prospects for gold accelerating to the upside. So I got to get involved." 
but they're not going to run out and do a $200 million financing for a, a junior mining company or a, you know, exotic startup company somewhere in a, in a district that's not producing cash flow. They're going to dip their toe in the water with the Kinrosses and the Alamoses and the IM goals that are a little safer, a little easier to understand, a little simpler businesses. And so those are where I'm starting to see some inflows. I have seen Kai, um, I heard recently anecdotally that a precious metals fund in North America got their first large inflow, multiple hundred million dollar new money inflow from a, from an Alice asset allocator, last month. So it's the first thing I've, the first time I've heard that in, in many, many years, despite the, the bull market we had in 2020, all those precious metal funds have been systematically outflowing capital. So they've been getting redemptions from their investors, forcing them to sell stocks, regardless of whether they like the sector or not. So inflows into that is extremely positive. And then I have seen a few bought deals. I have a bunch of friends on all the desks across Canada and the US that do junior mining. I heard there's a first a $15 million financing for a junior resource company that was three times oversubscribed. I have not heard that in a long, long time as well. So these are small, you know, green shoots, let's say, anecdotal signs that the money is starting to flow. But based on the macro backdrop, based on what I'm seeing, based on fundamentally what I know, I'm very confident these are true green shoots that are going to turn into real trees and really start to grow and attract a lot of capital. Because that's typically what you see really early in a rally is that wall of worry, skepticism. No one's talking about it. Some anecdotal green shoots, but just the hardcore believers like you and I kind of are talking about it. And then it starts to broaden out to mainstream. And that, that's where most of the money is made in a big bull market when it broadens out to a more large audience. Yeah, no, 100%. And one, one thing you mentioned to follow up on is competition. And I've said that in other interviews as well. It doesn't feel like the junior mining sector does have any competition right now. Because when, when we go to the, jun to the junior end of the market, competition is risk capital. Like you invest in junior stocks, what, what you can afford to invest. It's not like you're looking for the 5% dividend yield or something to, to secure retirement in, in, in the high end or in the high risk end of, of our sector. Do, do you see any competition in that? Uh, like we've we've had maybe as a, as an anecdote in the past, we've had to, to combat the wheat stock or yeah. the wheat stock craze, Bitcoin and the shitecoin craze. Um, like, do, do you see any competition there right now? Because I don't see a lot of AI companies pop up asking for investor capital uh, in in our sort of on our end of the market here. Yeah, there's not it's not such a big public market for the AI companies, but I can say the you're right. The the Bitcoin you know seems to be bloom off the rails a little bit, a little less frenzy than it was before. The cannabis stocks. I think the real competition has been the Nasdaq. Honestly, like people, the speculators. If you can buy Nvidia, one of the biggest companies in the world, and make 100 percent in six months, like some investors have done the last two years, you know you get big liquid stocks. You know, I was on uh, my my trading platform today, and you know the, the banks are now doing fractional shares. If you can't afford to buy a full share of Nvidia, you can buy one tenth of a share for 13 dollars. You know, to me, if that's not a sign of speculation, how to create a junior mining stock out of Nvidia is divided by 10 or 20, buy a fractional share because you can't afford to buy a full share. That tells you the extent of speculation that you're seeing in in these large cap tech stocks. But like I said, these tech stocks, you know, are really stretched in terms of valuation. They're really stretched in terms of fundamentals, in my view, in terms of expectations are very, very high. So myself being a contrarian investor, I love to be in the in the camp of low expectations and high reality versus, you know, high expectations and even you know lower reality or really high expectations and just good reality. Um, what I would say too, Kai, I think that the amount of speculative money going into private equity and tech is extremely high, right? There's trillions of billions of dollars, not trillions of dollars going into private AI startups. And I've been doing junior mining investing for a long time, been commodity for 25 years. I always look at my portfolio like a venture capital portfolio. You know, I own 25 names in junior resource sector, and I'm looking for two to five of those 25 names to be up 20 to 50 times. And there's going to be a lot of errors in my portfolio. A lot of them will not work out because you're not going to have commercial discoveries on every junior exploration play you have. That's not how it works. But the winners will pay for all the lose and give you a fantastic return over time if you stay, stay the course. I don't understand why investors are willing to back an AI startup with a PowerPoint presentation and a, and a famous founder and give it a $250 million valuation when you can buy a junior resource company with already an existing discovery with great attributes, de-risk to a large degree at a $5 to $10 million valuation. Because if you're playing that game of looking for 50 times your money, if you're getting in at a five to $10 million valuation, right? You don't need, the stock goes to $250 million mark cap. You've already made 50 times your money. If you're buying something at a $250 million mark cap, that is still extremely risky, like an AI Bass P startup. That thing has to go up into the hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap to give you your 50 times return. That's a much more difficult proposition. So all those men and women that have made tons of money in VC and tech and in these AI startups, good for them. But the risk reward for me in terms of entry cost versus potential upside in the mining space is simply fantastic. And once investors figure that out and say, wow, the risk reward here of allocating a capital to a basket of junior resource companies would have tremendously large payouts upon success, 
hopefully some of that money starts to flow. But that's how I look at things. Uh, I don't get caught up in the trend of the hour or the, the frenzy of the hour because that's how you end up losing a lot of money looking back five, 10 years. The dot com mm-hmm. boom, 2008. You see when people get over carried away with the real estate or dot coms, whatever it may be, looking back and never so pretty as it is today. No, no, lo- lo- lots of good points there, Michael. And you, you mentioned something. I, I- that was the lead, or is going to be the lead into my next question because I want to get more granular on the mining stocks themselves. But I want to break down the, your portfolio a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we don't have to discuss specific names, but I want to talk more categories. Like, how, how is your portfolio structure? You mentioned twenty five names are in the portfolio right now. Can you break it down for us a little bit so we can understand uh, your thought process a bit? Yeah, so I, I take that P the PE venture capital approach. I have about twenty five names, Kai. Um, typically, when I go into a name, I'll, I'll initially allocate anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5% of my total portfolio to that name, right? So I'll make an investment in that in that position. And again, my, my criteria would be I'm looking for things that have potential to be mine, but really early in the life cycle, like at a $5, $10 million market cap. So they may have a discovery hole. They may have a modest resource that has potential to grow substantially. But I'm looking at all the attributes, having invested in producing commodity companies for over 25 years professionally, I'm looking for all the attributes that those producing minds have had historically and kind of back testing it or back imposing it on a five to $10 million junior resource company in the market. So initial check size, looking to own anywhere from five to 20% of the company for a 0.5 to 1.5% investment of my total portfolio. And my idea is if I'm right on that, it'll go up 20 to 50 times. So that 1% investment goes 20% of my portfolio or 50% of my portfolio and a, and a really positive outcome. And therefore I spread my bets over, over a bunch of companies. And then the ones that start to work, I'll press my bet or increase my position in future financings, be supportive. I, I don't sell, I don't, I don't day trade drill results. I'm not looking to promote things and sell. I am very sticky. Typically I'm an insider filer. I'm over 10% of the company. So I'm looking for that venture capital liquidity moment, which is an exit, you know, get acquired. And we could talk about that later in the interview, but I think the MA cycle is going to start to heat up here. It already is. So my exit is when management exits. My exit is when we have a liquidity moment where the stock becomes mainstream, main board listed, you know, billion dollar market cap, or a takeout by a larger company that, you know, crystallizes the value. And, and then on, when I have a takeout or have a liquidity event, I will recycle that capital back into, you know, more names at 1% of my portfolio that are trying to find the next, the next set of uh, future mines, right? So that's the model I adopt. A lot of people watch my stuff and go, okay, Mike likes this stock. Therefore, I'm going to put all my money in one name. That's not how I invest my money. Some of them end up a lot bigger than others because they they grow into the stories I dream them to be. But the idea is to, to, to be disciplined. Your entry, your entry point has to be very disciplined in terms of what market cap you're paying and the risk reward you have at that point in time. And disciplined about you know spreading your bets over 20, 25 names so you have the opportunity to uncover a few mines, right? If all 25 names were mines, the business would not work because it'd be an uh, overflow of some surplus commodities everywhere because it'd be too, too easy to find mines. You'd have so much commodity supply that the commodities wouldn't be worth anything. It's hard to find producing mines, but by doing your homework and having bear markets, you can actually pick up future mines or potential future mines at five, 10, $15 million market caps, where normally your entry ticket would be hundred, $150 million for those type of projects because the market would be discounting it properly. In the case of AI, they're overpaying for future potential AI startups. In our case, they're massively underpaying for the potential of these operations if you pick them properly. And there's a whole list of criteria that I look for and, you know, reasons to say no. I get, as you know, hundreds of phone calls a, a month on please invest in my junior, please. And, and 99 times out of 100, it's, it's no. And there's many reasons to say no. But when they get through all those criteria, it doesn't mean they're going to work. It just means they have a better chance of success than throwing darts at a dartboard and, and just buying every junior you see under the sun. Yeah. Have you, have you been nicknamed Dr. No yet by the market? <laughs> people know that <laughs> I, think, I think a junior resource company you're used to hearing no but i, I have at least i have reasons to say no when i when i say no yeah i know 100 um, percent. One, one thing i haven't heard uh, you say there's like how, how commodity uh, commodity agnostic are you michael yeah it's a good question uh i am i have been i am and have been uh, biased towards gold and precious metals for the last kind of several years more more informed by my macro view especially recently i do think uh, the economy is slowing here and that's out of, that, that is out of control. So for me, from a macro perspective, gold had the least amount of risk in terms of my upside price projections. But I own you know zinc companies, I own oil and gas companies, I own copper. Uh, I'm pretty much commodity agnostic. If I really like the deposit, I like the risk reward, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of my criteria and the potential return potential. And I don't have a negative view on the commodity. So for example, lithium, you know, two years ago, if you called me on a lithium stock, I would hang up the phone right away not because i didn't want to look at the resource or because i didn't like the management team but my view on the commodity was it was completely overdone way too hot 
way too hyped. And so I said the, the downside risk to lithium prices was was real. I didn't think it was going to be as bad as it is today, but I knew there was a lot of downside to commodity price projections. So I don't want to buy a junior or a, a five-year investment in something where the next two, three years, I expect the price to go down. So as long as my commodity view is flat to up, as long as my entry point is correct, I like the team, like the asset, I think it has a shot to make 20, 50 times. I am positively disposed to look at it. When I have a positive view like I had on gold, then I'll, I'll see a larger weighting in my portfolio in precious metals, but it doesn't stop me from looking at everything else under the sun, as long as I'm not negative on the macro. Yeah. Um, maybe to circle back to sentiment, Michael, is a, a bit it's like I posted over the weekend, like that we're reaching the bottom of the barrel here in junior exploration. I, I was triggered. I was reading the news or it was going through X on, uh, I think it was Saturday morning over a cup of coffee. And uh, I was reading that one of the companies put out a press release Friday night before the long weekend, by the way, great timing. Um, that they ran out of money for their drill campaign, so they had to stop mid 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 campaign. Uh, another company announced a convertible debenture or some debt instrument, five hundred thousand dollars at fifteen percent interest, but it's only a five million market cap company. And I'm just sitting there reading this. It's like this has to be the, the bottom. Like how how can you announce stuff like that? And um, Rick Rule chimed in and uh, he said, "Well, the industry is stupidly overfunded." Right. And uh, I was like, I, I tend to agree to a degree, but with a different spin on it. And we briefly discussed this beforehand, and I want to get your take on it. Do, do, you, do you think the industry is overfunded, actually? Is, uh, is that the case? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to put words in Rick Rule's mouth, but I would say I would agree and disagree at the same time. I'd say there's too many mining companies, for sure. I know he's hit that publicly, so I know I'm relying on that comment. I think if there's a 500 or 1,000 junior mining companies in the world, there probably should be 100, right? There aren't enough. I see this firsthand every single day. I think there's more, you know, more quality deposits than there are quality management teams, but there's many multiples, fewer quality deposits and quality management teams than there are mining companies. So I think we have too many mining companies, junior mining companies in the space. And therefore, let's say you have a million dollars to invest and that's enough money to properly fund the juniors resource sector for the next year, I'm using very small numbers just to keep it simple for your viewers, but there's a hundred mining companies trying to take that million dollars, right? What really needs to happen is there should be 10 mining companies taking hundred thousand dollars each instead of hundred mining companies taking say $10,000 each, right? Or a thousand dollars each in the math of my head, $10,000 each. So the, the junior mining companies are, the money's getting dispersed amongst too many low quality teams, too many low quality projects. And therefore the class average, the return for those junior mining companies is very poor because 90 of those hundred companies shouldn't exist. So they all find their way to zero, right? And the 10 that should exist they need $100,000 to move forward, but they only got 10. So they're chronically underfunded. Therefore, their share prices are artificially low because not enough capital to give them a good cost of capital. And so they're forced to raise money at really bad valuations for investors, massive dilution, and their projects do end up becoming mines, but you end up with a billion shares by the time you get there. So if there was more Rick Rules, more Mike Gentiles, more Kai Hoffman's doing their work, right? There was more investors you know, doing the due diligence on these companies and weeding out the bad ones and making sure those ones just don't get any funding at all, then there'd be more money for the good ones, which would lower the cost of capital for the good ones, which would increase the success rate of the industry, which would attract more investors because they have positive outcomes. So, you know, what I look for, Kai, is if you look at my companies, I'm always a big investor, 5%, 20% investor. When I get invested in something, I want management to have a lot of skin in the game. I want them to have written a check and not penny paper, not one cent free stock that they got on some deal. How much real money do you put in at what price and what price am I coming in alongside you? Because if you put real cash in a business, real investment, you're going to stay up all night trying to figure out how to get it forward. And you're also going to not promote garbage, right? So I think that's what I look for is heavy equity investment from the board and management. You can be a 35 or 30 year old founder with no money and that's okay. And I can hear your story and go, okay, I'll give you that pass. But if you've been in the business for 30, 40 years or 20, 30 years and I ask you how much money do you put in? You're like, nothing. I put in $10,000, but I have a million dollars worth of free Sweat stock. Sweat equity. Sweat equity, sweat yeah. equity. But I mean, I want to see a real check equity because that's what makes you work hard and dif different. And that's, let me know, are you there for the long haul? Or are you there for a quick promote and sell out of the company? So that that needs to be better governed. And there's just not enough, I think, sophisticated investors in this space. So they pry on the retail investors. They pry on the less sophisticated investors that will give them money to fund their lifestyle or fund the company or when they run out of cash to fund a drill program and allows those companies to perpetuate themselves. But they're pulling money away from the real winners. And that's what we've got to figure out in this industry is how do we get more money in the hands of winners and less money in the hands of, of opportunists and losers. No. I, I call those companies cockroaches because they just won't die. Like yeah. even in 2015, and I posted about that, I think on X six months ago, because I, I keep, I, I read press releases on a daily basis, but once in a while there's one who's like, oh, that company is still alive. 
that they still exist. I, I heard that I heard that name last time five years ago. Uh, so the question is, why don't they die though? Why don't they disappear? Like great, who, who do we question. blame, right? Yeah, like a, who, who do we blame? Team. Like is it the yeah. exchanges? Is it the investors? Is it the creative executive management team? Is it all of the above? Like why don't they die? You know, and if you have if you have a house that's worth a lot of money, let's say you're trying to sell your house for two million dollars in a nice neighborhood somewhere, but it's full of cockroaches, you're going to dramatically lower your price of your house. That goes back to my point earlier, right? The cockroaches dramatically decrease the value of the quality homes in the junior resource market that should be getting good valuations. Why don't they die? There's enough people willing to fund the half million dollar, million dollar kind of lifestyle GNA checks in this business. You know, if, if I, I'm very transparent. If I, if I have a, co a company in my portfolio that should die, I stop funding it, right? And so I let it, and, and because my business model is I invest in 25 companies and if they don't work out, you're looking, trying to make an exploration discovery, you're trying to have a test a theory or prove something out in, in the geology market, you, you never get it right 100% of the time. So if the company doesn't prove itself out and doesn't, doesn't work out, that's, that's part of the game, but I'm not going to keep funding it for the next five years because I made an investment five years ago. I'm going to fund the ones that had the most chance to become mines. And if more investors thought that way, the other ones would die. But I don't think you can, we live in, capital markets are free. They have to be free to, to function properly. So if, if investors want to throw money at bad management teams, you know, that's, that's their prerogative, but they should be more discerning. They should watch more of Kai Hoffman and others and you know, educate themselves on, on what's a good junior resource best, what's a bad one. And understanding that the professionals like Rick Rule and myself make mistakes all the time. That's part of the game, but you're trying to put the odds in your favor. It's a probability based approach. And, and the more work you do and the more you de-risk the investment ahead of time and you get in at a good price, the better your odds are, but it's still a tough game, but the, pay, the payouts are huge if you're white. So that's why we do it. Do you, do you have an anecdote for us where you said, okay, I'm done funding this. Like you're, you're doing something that I don't like. Do you, do you have an example for us? No, usually when it, if they're, so if I like the asset, Okay, and I don't like what they're doing. I've been involved in quite a few companies where I've swapped the board out or changed management. Right, uh, I've been in situations where people have drilled and not discovered uh, a bunch. A bunch of companies. I've, I've avoid mentioning names because I think it's, it's unkind and unfair. I don't want. No, I don't want you to name names. Just but I would say yeah, exactly. pl plenty of stories where I wrote my initial check at 05 percent or one percent of my portfolio, and we're looking for a porphyry in Chile. We're looking for a you know a new a new argentic gold zone in the IBTB somewhere, and you drill and it's just not there. The geology's not working out right, and so. What I don't like in the business is the, is the bait and switch. You know, you drill the first target. Okay, well, that one didn't work out, but I got a new one. Well, I, I funded this thing. I did all my work on this porphyry target. I did all this work on this organic gold zone, and that didn't work out. So I'm not interested in the next, the next card you're going to pull out of your sleeve. It, I'll look at it on a, on a standalone basis, but just because I'm invested in the company does not mean I need to fund your, your B project or your C project. I invested in the A project. The A project did not work out. That's expiration. That's life. Unless they've got something really compelling in a second project that I really liked, out of the gate, and that was part of the plan to fund it, I'm highly unlikely to fund the second round just because I made an investment. And that's, I think anchoring is a mistake a lot of people kind of make, right? You made an initial investment, you're down, but you got to keep funding it because you've already lost money on it. I'd rather redeploy capital the one that I think has the most opportunity to go up now, not something because I invested in the past and it may be down that I've got to keep funding in the future. These are hard mental constructs for people to to get past, right? But but you have to really be cold, cold hearted, very clear, clear headed and say, look, where's the next dollar that I'm going to put out of my portfolio? Where's the best place I can put it to, to, to increase my chance of positive return? And that's how I try to look at things. So it almost sounds like you don't invest into management teams where the ge ge uh, geologist is the CEO of the company. Because <laughs> that's like almost like 80%, 85%. That's the MO, how they operate. It's like, oh, look, we got this great target. And then uh, they, they just keep on going, just keep beating a dead horse. I, lo I love geos. I know a lot of really good geos. So I mean, it's all respect in the world. But if you give a geo $5 million, he'll spend $5 million. If you give him $10 million, he'll spend $10 million. So what I try to do is, and I, I know nothing about geology, so I can be a bit of a pain to sit, sit on some of these meetings sometimes with the geology team. But I, I'm, not, I'm not there to spot holes or tell the geology teams where to drill. But I take my portfolio manager uh, capital allocator hat on and go, okay, we're spending $2 million on this drill program. If we're right, what are we going to learn? And if we're right, where are we going to be in the next fundraising to tell the market the progress we've made? So what are the chances of success of these holes? If we hit, what is the expected outcome? And is that outcome good or not? Because I hear a lot of geos saying, well, we're going to learn a lot about the geology. We're going to learn a lot about the strategic fee. We're going to learn a lot about the project. I go, in this kind of market, you know, geologic success, but economic failure is going to result in your stock price going to $2 million market cap. So let's focus our money on the targets that can have economic and geological success. And if it's not working, if you if you have a $3 million budget, your first half a million dollars is in the ground, you're scratching your head going, that's not all we're expecting to see. 
why don't you cut, kill that program, put the two and a half million dollars in the bank, let's regroup and, and reassess where the next dollar should go. But a lot of geologists will keep going drilling, even though the initial indications are showing them that it's not what they thought was there. Maybe it is the right thing to keep going, but a lot of times it's not. Take a pause, preserve that well, well earned capital that's hard to get. And let's, let's think about what the next target should be. So I like to sit on those geology meetings and the companies have a big shareholder in. Not because I want to be a pain in the ass, not because I want to think I'm a geologist, but just to ask those questions as, what is the return on this dollar? If, if your expectations for a drill hole are learning or a moderate success ahead of time, moderate success is not going to cut in this market. Is there a target that could have a big success or a huge impact or really drive this, this project to a new level? Those are the holes you want to focus on and helping them understand the context of the market, how scarce capital is, how difficult capital is to raise, you know, how painful failure could be sharpens the mind, take, maybe turns that $3 million budget into a $1 million budget to preserve $2 million for another day. That's sort of the kind of conversations I like to have with the junior geologists. At the same time, Kai, I will never invest in a company that doesn't have a good geologist because you you see the disaster of a, a nice financier in a, in a boss or Gucci suit that'll tell you, you know, all the great things about a company, but they have no idea geologic what they're doing. So you need both. You need a, a really strong geology team and a really strong uh, financial capital markets team, and you need a lot of skin in the game. If you have those three things, it doesn't ensure success, but it helps really increase your, your batting average. A hundred percent. And to, ideally, it's a it's a two punch combo. You have a really smart president um, who sort of runs a thing, and then maybe the CEO is a geologist, and they show up together, and that's the perfect combination, yeah. in my opinion. Right. Um, Trying to shift gears, I have a couple more talking points, but it's really difficult to have it uh, to fit them into a smooth conversation here. But uh, you talk financing; that brings me sort of to flow through financing and the whole flow through scheme. You're based in Montreal. You're you're in Quebec. Um, I'm really curious. What what are your thoughts on the flow through model in general? Like, does does it help Canadian mining? So multiple levels thoughts there. I have a lot of thought of flow through. I am based in Quebec in Canada, so I have a lot of familiarity with the flow through market. First of all, I'd say the flow through market has been hugely beneficial to funding exploration in Canada. So I'm very positive on the flow through model because I think it's bringing, especially in the last six years, Kai, where we've had a real, or even longer, 12 years, if you look at it, a real dearth of capital available for exploration in Canada. Uh, this flow through model has allowed exploration to continue to at least some degree, when otherwise it would have been completely a graveyard in my view in terms of exploration. Uh, being a big investor and a board member and a strategic investor in a lot of junior mining companies that have access to flow through capital, being Canadian the projects they'll be working on, I would say you have to be very careful on the issuer side, on the corporate side, the, the investor side of, of who you sell flow through shares to. Because the flow through model is such that the junior mining companies get a percent of whatever they spend back from the government. Either that goes in the form of a higher premium on the stock price, you can sell shares above where they trade today, and the investors get the tax credit and the company gets a lower cost of capital. Or you spend money in the ground, you get a check from the government into the year back as a tax credit on your cash credit to your company. So what ends up happening is a lot of investors invest in flow through, not like me, who want to actually own these shares of these companies and have a five to seven year horizon and looking for 20, 50 times their money. They're investing in these flow through shares to buy them on Monday and sell them on Tuesday and pocket the tax credit. And they don't really care what company they own because they get a big credit on their tax return for buying a share of a Canadian exploration company. So I always make the joke, if you do a flow through financing, you're selling it twice, once on the issue. And then four months later, when the four month hole comes back off that financing, you're selling it again, because all those shareholders who bought for the tax credits are selling in the market. You got to find the equal amount of buyers that, that bought the financing to buy them out. So the companies that work with me know when we get flow through funds or flow through investors that I know are tax motivated only in on financings, 99 times out of 100, I'm saying we're not taking that money. Because like I said, I know that money is only in there for four months or six months or a year, and they're, they're motivated by tax credits and not by investing. If you can find investors that want to own the shares for three to five, seven years and are happy to take advantage of the tax credit, I love those investors. I will encourage my companies to take those investors all day long. But there's a big difference between those two. So flow through investing, amazing for Canada, creates a lot of uh, exploration where there otherwise would not be. But for the corporates out there, uh, be careful on who you're accepting money from because it can create a, a real problem in your share price. Sometimes beggars can't be choosers. Sometimes you're choosing between no financing or a flow through financing. That's a tough decision to make. But just be, be aware of who's behind the buying because it can create a lot of problems in your stock later on. Yeah, the overhand can be absolutely massive, especially when the flow through financing is being offered at a discount. With Correct. a warrant. Or, or warrant. That's exactly. driving, me, that's driving yes. me insane. And that's the biggest yeah. red flag somebody could wave in, in, in my face, quite yeah. honestly. So um, really, really interesting thoughts. Um, on the topic of Canada, and uh, it's a it's a controversial question next here is is Canada still a tier one jurisdiction? 
Um, I think for producing, it's a great question. I think a lot about it. I'm invested in Canada and outside Canada. We asked about my commodity uh, picture. I'm agnostic on the commodity side. I'm also pretty agnostic when it comes to geo geology, geography. You know, I'll go anywhere in the world if I like the deposit. Obviously, the, the, the risk assessment and the cost of capital and the valuation has to be compensated if I'm going outside of Canada and the U.S., let's say. But I think, quite honestly, I think Canada and the U.S., in many degrees are overrated as a tier one mining jurisdiction, especially for the juniors. So I would say if you're a producing asset in Canada or the US, uh, that tier one or premier mining jurisdiction is absolutely justified because there's stability for now, thankfully, on taxes and, and right of ownership and you know, private property is very, very strong in Canada and the US. So if you have a producing cash flowing asset in Canada and the US, I would say the premiums are well justified and I would say it's a premier mining jurisdiction. Where we can start to have a debate or an argument would be, is it still a tier one mining jurisdiction for a early stage resource company? And why I ask that is the permitting process in Canada has become so cumbersome that if you make a discovery today in Canada, you're probably 15 years away from being a producer, even if it's a tier one discovery hole right out of the gate, because the just the hurdles and the red tape and the bureaucracy and the environmental and all, all the issues that come around that are, are so difficult to get into production. That has a dramatic value on the net present value of your project. Whereas in let's say West Africa or other parts of the world where you make a discovery, which is maybe less uh, politically appealing or the headlines would say, well, don't go there. You can make a discovery and be in production in three years. So when you talk about three years versus 15 years, that's a dramatic change in your net present value calculation. So if you can cross the bridge and make from a resource story to a discovery in Canada, your project's gonna be extremely valued, well valued in the market. So there is a huge prize on that. But those investors have to be extremely patient, right? Because there's a long time from discovery to production. Whereas other areas, you can go to production really quick, but probably get a lower valuation in the market. So you have to assess that when you're making an investment. That's why I try to find projects that are, at least in Canada anyway, that are a little farther along, that maybe have an economic study already in place, already made some significant progress with the First Nations, made significant progress with infrastructure, and there's a quicker path to production that could be short, either existing permits or existing infrastructure or whatever that may be. Well, there's a bit of a shorter timeline than going from a discovery hole to to a new discover to a producing asset but that's a really good question probably what we could do a whole interview on but i think investors have to be very nuanced what are you paying what risks are present and not just say canada good west africa bad or us good or you know australia bad or maybe you, you got to really understand the the local as well like some jurisdictions in canada are really good and some are not so good so you have to understand that the nuance of that as well, but that's definitely part of the work I do when I make an investment in a company. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's probably a whole episode by itself just to go through the, the entire provinces and territories in Canada and just really rank them and uh, properly look at them uh, in terms of government licensing and permitting, but also social licensing and permitting as well. Very uh, di different ball game there as well. Um, Michael, maybe one last thing to, to sort of summarize the conversation. We have conference season coming up. Uh, I'm headed to Beaver Creek myself here next week. Um, well, what do you expect to come out of conference season? Um, we've seen a bit of M&A activity over the summer. Um, uh, Goldfields is a, uh, acquiring a Cisco Mining. Do you expect more deals to come out? And uh, do, do you expect maybe the conference season to change the attitudes towards junior mining and exploration? Yeah, I, th I think uh, the corporate interest is really interesting. So you mentioned Goldfields and Philo. So Philo Mining and, and uh, Cisco Mining stakeouts were probably two of the more exciting events I've seen in the last five years in the space for junior mining resource stocks. And, and why I say that is we have seen quite a bit of M&A, Kai, the last five, six years, but a lot of it's been merger of equals, uh, producing assets, buying other producing assets, uh, producers buying assets that are three months away, six months away, nine months away from production. So essentially producers buying more production, right? Like kind of companies trying to bulk up their, their top line, whether it be gold or copper, or whatever they might be producing, trying to increase the volume that they produce and have a more relevant market cap in the, in the market space. The Philo deal and the Cisco mining deal were, were really exciting and very informative for me, Kai, anyway, because those are the first two deals we've seen where assets were acquired for multiple billions of dollars in assets that are still multiple years away from production. So that tells me that most of the M&A most of the assets that could be acquired that are either producing very close to producing or already in production have been acquired. And therefore the corporates are now being forced to move down to the next tier of assets that are, you know, two to five years away from production. And they're willing to take on permitting risk and construction risk again in, in the metals and mining space, which is really exciting. Kai. It tells you the inventory stuff that's is pretty much the cupboards are bare. We know expiration has been dead in the water for like 12 years or more. So the discovery cycles are, are really elongated because there's not money to explore anymore. And so you either have a project that is two to five years away, maybe five, 10 years away, that are becoming more and more attractive. 
The other tidbit I found really interesting is Goldfields mentioned in their 70% premium, which is a dramatic premium, guys, you know, cash cash premium for Cisco. The reason why they did it was there was multiple bidders in the room. And that was really informative to me as well, because they already have 50% of the asset. So the other buyers that were in the room for that were looking for a 50% JV stake with Goldfields to buy a windfall, which is a Cisco asset. So if there's multiple bidders for a 50% JV stake for an asset in Canada, that also tells you, because typically big mining companies do not want to be in 50-50% JVs. They want to own 100% or nothing. So the fact there's multiple bidders for 50% of a JV tells you how scarce the landscape is of quality projects that can be in production in the next two to four years. So I think the corporates, as we mentioned earlier in the interview, Kai, are now flush with cash. Their margins are expanding. Their balance sheets are clean. They're going to be making more and more free cash flow. The pool of companies or assets they can buy is dwindling by the minute. And yet the junior resource companies, which, which I own, maybe you own some too, which are maybe a couple of years behind where Cisco or Philo are, are trading at pennies on the dollar. And so the other point I make too, Kai, is that you can buy it or you can find it. And so the, the expiration cost, discovery cost of an average multi-million ounce resource, if you add up all the failures, let's say Newmont's portfolio or Barrick's portfolio or Kinross portfolio, you're probably talking $150, $200 an ounce if you're lucky. When you add up all the money spent on expiration versus what they end up finding that could be an economic deposit. Or you can go to the junior resource sector and buy it for 5 to $20 an ounce in the ground. So you can explore for it, which takes time and a lot of money, or you can buy it in the market today at pennies on the dollar. And so I think the next wave of M&A is going to be whatever products are left in that close to production category, they'll be snapped up. And that's why you're seeing Artemis and Skeena, some of these stocks really start to work. And once those are gone, the only available opportunity is going to be go explore yourself on green, greenfield projects or go buy the juniors trading at pennies on the dollar. And once a few of these juniors start getting taken out, I, the, 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 bell, the gun will be shot, the bell will be rung, and all the juniors start to react to the, the, the idea that there's going to be M&A in the junior resource sector again. And that coupled with a strong gold price, some of the stuff we talked about earlier, which is the market maybe being less robust overall, the market tech market overall, could, could be a really nice picture for, for the junior resource space. Michael, you just gave me a phenomenal idea for a T-shirt, for a slogan on a T-shirt. It's go explore yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think actually yeah. it makes a lot of sense. G U Y yeah. instead of G F Y. Um, yeah. No, really, really great T-shirt idea. And uh, maybe uh, I, I got a few days till Beaver Creek. Maybe I'll do yeah. that. Yeah, you know, uh, juniors can buy them on the way, and they can wear the, the, the corporate meetings they have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think based on what I've seen, there's going to be a lot of corporates around in Beaver Creek. And um, yeah. I'm actually really looking forward to catching up. As you said, valuations are d absolutely depressed still, which is a huge opportunity for us investors. Um, Michael, phenomenal conversation. I could chat with you for hours about junior mining. There's so many things we haven't even touched on, but uh, we'll, we'll save that for part two because we can still break down some of the commodities and other topics here as well. But uh, where can we follow your work, Michael, if you wanted to invest with you alongside you? It's like, where can we find more of your knowledge? You know, I'm, I, I keep a pretty small footprint on social media. Um, I literally post once in a while on LinkedIn and what's, what's going on in my professional network. Uh, I obviously press release the, the big investments that I do. I do YouTube interviews like this once a month or once every two months is to keep investors up to date on what I'm thinking and doing. But I, I'm not, uh, I focus most of my time on, on investing. Uh, and I do this occasionally just to give uh, investors that want to follow what I'm doing an idea. But I'm not, uh, not a big social media personality. So you can find me on YouTube probably. If you Google my name, you'll see my recent thoughts. It's probably the best place to catch up on where I'm, what I'm thinking. No, phenomenal. Michael, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Really appreciate it. And of course, we'll catch up very soon. Uh, hopefully in person, maybe over a glass of red wine or so. Uh, we can explain some more of the ideas of what's going on actually behind the scenes here in junior mining. Michael, thank you so much. And to uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. If you enjoyed this conversation, we it, it was heavily focused on the micro this time because uh, we, we need to understand what is going on in, uh, in our portfolios here as well. And uh, maybe shed some light on some of the shenanigans and other things that, that are happening in junior mining and how can we become better investors we're trying to educate here there's lots to learn there's lots to you know keep up on in in junior mining but uh there's also lots of money to be made in my opinion and uh, my portfolio has been suffering for the last couple of years but uh, it's it's turning around so i'm really looking forward for the next few months I'm really looking forward to my meetings in beaver creek and uh, i'm really looking forward to your feedback leave it down below and uh, we'll be back with lots more here on soar financially thank you so much for tuning in